Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. I'm here with John Furrier and David Floyer, who are on the West Coast in our SiliconANGLE studios in Palo Alto. And gentlemen, we just heard from an IT practitioner. I mean, essentially, David, as you pointed out, these guys are just trying to keep the lights on. They're trying to make their existing applications run faster. Database is the big challenge. Um, and it's interesting to note that uh, Karim Abdullah of Sprint is putting TMS, the, the, what's now called IBM Flash Systems, behind a SAN volume controller. Now, part of the reason for that is, David, you've explained to me that TMS doesn't have a rich set of software yet. IBM hasn't ported anything over the data management, volume management, storage management stack. So they're essentially bogarting the stack from SAN volume controller, which is pretty good. Um, talk about that a little bit. Is that a viable long-term strategy in your view? Oh, as a short-term strategy, it's fine. Um, and it has the advantage uh, if, uh, if as, as I suspect, uh, Sprint has a lot of uh, SVC, the storage volume controller, that they're probably using that as the standard uh, set of tools, both for replication, for, uh, uh, for thin provisioning, and all the other added value storage services. Um, at, at the moment, this is true across the board. There isn't really a tier one uh, there isn't a tier one uh, flash-only device uh, out in the marketplace. Uh, so uh, if you want those facilities, you either put them behind an SVC. That's not ideal. You'd like to be able to do that directly. You'd like to be able to m map those type of functions onto how the flash could most be efficiently used. Those are coming. Um, you know, EMC is obviously investing them. IBM is investing them. Uh, HP, uh, everybody is, uh, is NetApp, all investing in those types of uh, capabilities. But they're not here yet, and the SVC is an obvious way to go in the short term. So David, what do you see for all flash array pricing? Where are we at on uh, a sort of dollar per whatever, gigabyte? Well, it, it, it depends on the type of, uh, uh, on the functionality and on the type of, uh, uh, technology used. There's two major types of technology, S, um, uh, SLC flash and MLC flash. Uh, the MLC flash is the same as consumer flash uh, and, and half the price or even less. Uh, SLC flash is uh, much more the, the, the uh, enterprise level flash. Uh, so if you're, if you're looking at uh, uh, SLC, you're talking around the $15 per gigabyte uh, that sort of order. If you're, if you're talking about using uh, uh, deduplication and compression and MLC, you're coming down into the $5 a gigabyte or lower, uh, f f around $5 a gigabyte, that, that type of pricing. Um, if you are looking at the, uh, the hyperscale market, which is a very specific marketplace where you're designing things to last only a certain number of, uh, of years, for example, you're getting down to the three ninety dollars per gigabyte in that sort of area, so it, 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 it's uh, dependent. But that's the sort of range that you're getting at. Obviously, disk is much much lower than that. You can get disk uh, sub uh, one sub gigabyte uh, uh, sub dollars per gigabyte. Uh, so that's clearly volume disk is much lower. But from a performance point of view, uh, flash is really uh, at the same level as uh, high performance disk, as 15K disk, uh, um, the, uh, the um, uh, SAS 15K disks are around the same price. Okay, so, um, and I think I'm correct in that, um, I don't think that the IBM Flash systems, what used to be called Texas Memory Systems, I don't think they use MLC. So of course IBM's focusing on reliability, they're focusing, on, they're focusing on cost per IOP, which is smart. Uh, uh, because they're they're probably not the lowest cost out there, uh, and I don't believe they use compression and dedupe yet, which which eventually is going to happen. They bought Storewise a couple years ago. That's going to move in. But John Furry, I want to go to you uh, and and see what you're hearing in the valley in terms of pricing, in terms of supply. Um, you know, there aren't a lot of suppliers of NAND flash. Um, what are you hearing in uh, Silicon Valley? Well, Dave, I think. The um, supply chain, as I mentioned earlier, is a big competitive advantage. So you have a lot of people here who are interested in that. Um, on the data center side, you got Google and Facebook, they build their own stuff, especially Google. And on the supplier side, you look at Intel, okay? You have violin memory systems here in Silicon Valley, although Fusion IO will hear from them later, they're in Salt Lake City an hour away on a plane, but 
huge issues here. And again, this comes back down to managing the strategy of architecture and component buying. What I'm hearing in Silicon Valley is that Intel's having some struggles um, on, on the quality and the amount of uh, NAND they could get as well as Violin has locked in, it's been reported, they have a relationship and, and are essentially cornering the market. Now that leaves a lot of opportunities. Some are speculating that a new player is going to come in at the $3 price point underneath that and just decimate the market. Uh, we have a source out there that um, we're trying to get some reports from. We might actually have some commentary and confirm that later around who that player might be. We don't know. Uh, we're investigating that here. But what you're hearing here is, is that all this flash discussion is all fine and dandy. We could talk about it all day long, but there might be a serious shortage in the marketplace and that's going to increase the prices and change some of the dynamics amongst the big players. Yeah, now Micron is obviously a big player, uh, you know, uh, Boise and, and, and you, you mentioned Violin, they've got a, a, a partnership with Toshiba. All the, many yeah. of the flash guys are trying to lock in I don't want to say, I don't want to report you, but I think Micron might be the one we're trying to get a confirmation on that. But that's that's what we're hearing. Um, again, Dave, you know, you, <laughs> supply is an issue. Uh, you can there's a ton of supply, but if they if the quality isn't there, you're going to have a lot of product failures in the field. And we've seen this movie before. I mean, the bubble. Go back to the '80s, the PC revolution. Remember the Winchester disk drive for all the young ones out there? They don't remember those days. It was a brutal bubble. And so again, we're seeing same kind of dynamics of that that Winchester disk drive back in the PC revolution. There will be might be a flood of quality problems on the flash media itself. Big red flag, and all the vendors are paying attention. Yeah. Now uh, the other piece of the action here, the EMC has uh, announced uh, Extreme IO. They announced cards, which are reportedly the Virident cards. We asked the EMC to come onto this program, but they they declined. Just I guess too much stuff going on. Or, um, you know, it just wasn't the right timing for them. Of course, it was short notice, but but we 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 did invite EMC on. But uh, but they are selling. Hey, why why? Well, I have to ask you a question. Why didn't they come on? Was it they said they were busy? I mean, come on. I mean, they're doing a lot of controlled messaging. So you know, I love EMC's launches. They do a flare and they try to control the narrative, as Jeremy Burton always talks about. But you know, this is an important area. What what was the real reason why they stayed at home? I, I don't know. I mean, you know, it was short notice. Admittedly, we decided to do this flash cube on short notice. I reached out to. Uh, a number of, of folks, uh, as, as we know. Um, I, I got many people who wanted to come on, some couldn't. Uh, EMC, you know, guys basically was just, I think, too short notice, just got back from vacation last week in the East Coast, and we just couldn't pull it off. But what I wanted to say about those guys, and, and I don't know, you may, maybe they do, we weren't comfortable, you know, con that they couldn't control the narrative. I'm not sure, but uh, you'd have to ask them that. But but nonetheless, we'll have them on. I, I guarantee we'll get them on. We're going to be at EMC World, and I'm sure we get them to talk. But supposedly they're, they're OEMing the Virident card. The point I want to make there is you've got Seagate and Virident um, as in the supply chain selling to EMC. Now, David Floyer, we know that EMC is not going to lose on price. They are going to get footprint and they're going to sell software and they're going to sell services. So that is a disruptive force. You've got Violin, who we're going to hear from next. We're going to hear from Don Basile, their CEO, trying to lock in a supply chain deal with Toshiba. Uh, you've got other guys, you know, Fusion IO and others locking in supply chain deals. Uh, the pricing is going to get really interesting. As John said, supply could be lower. Um, you know, there's maybe a little cartel amongst the makers here. And then, of course, you've got Intel looming, but they're not moving fast enough. So, I don't know if you guys have any comments on that. Uh, if you do, great. Um, and then sure. let's go to, uh, to, to Don Basile in a moment. But David, any comments on that? Sure. Uh, uh, every technology goes through these little bubbles and, and back down again. If you remember a couple of years ago, we had exactly the same issue in terms of uh, uh, interruptions to the, to the flash marketplace. And the, the flash goes up for a time and then comes down as new technology, new uh, uh, um, uh, lower nanometer uh, technologies uh, uh, come in. Um, the, the, the important thing in from the Seagate perspective or from the, uh, the storage perspective is that all innovation in terms of uh, new levels of high performance disk have all dried up. Uh, the, all of the attention in the, in the disk marketplace is to make uh, inexpensive tubs of data, as much data as they can get into it. Uh, so that really, uh, that, that's not going to be a solution to go out and, and go for a higher speed disk. That's, that's not a solution long term in the marketplace. So NAND will go up and down, but the overall uh, thrust is that NAND prices will come out 
uh, the, uh, from a performance point of view to be a lower price than the, the equivalent discs. And they'll take a larger and larger percentage of the high performance market, the active data market. The passive data, that will all be on disk. Yeah, okay, so, uh, so we're seeing a big range of pricing from $3 per gigabyte in the, in the PCIe hyperscale market all the way up to as high as 15 for the non-MLC, non-deduped, non-compressed, big range. One of the players here is Don Basile. We've got a video of Don from, uh, from last year. He stopped by at EMC World and talked to me. Uh, you'll see I botched his name. I called him Basile, like my friend Peter Basile. But uh, Don was very gracious and, and, uh, and didn't embarrass me. But, uh, but at any rate, let's watch this video from Don Basile a violin, a player that's uh, readying to do an IPO, and somebody who's clearly figured out how to sell into the marketplace. Let's watch this video. Hi everybody, this is Dave Vellante. We're back, we're live from EMC World 2012, and uh, this is SiliconAngle.tv's continuous coverage of EMC World. As I said at the top of the, the show, we've got a simulcast going on at the HBase conference in San Francisco. My co-host John Furrier flew out to that last night, so we'll be uh, simulcasting that. Go to SiliconAngle.tv, check the HBase link if you want to watch that program, but we're here live. We're here with Don Basile, the CEO of Violin Memory, uh, Violin Memory is one of the hottest flash startups on the planet right now. Uh, Don has uh, been growing the company, uh, uh, has a strong background, a former C uh, CEO and chairman of uh, Fusion IO, uh, has raised, I believe, 190 million. We're going to get into that for Violin Memory, getting ready to do an IPO. Don, Dr. Basili, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for having me, David. Good to see you. It's great seeing you. Appreciate Thanks you spending so much. some time here. We're here That's with exciting. David Floyer as well. Yeah, the, you, we were talking off camera, you said this is your first EMC world. Uh, it uh, is, it is. I like VMworld, I go to that uh, many times, but my first time at EMC World, and uh, here it's a record for EMC. It's quite an event, uh, isn't it? Now, I got to ask you, are you here as a, you know, like a VPlex sort of partner? Are you here as a friend, a foe? I mean, it's, uh, well, uh, one of our partners, uh, ICI, uh, has us in uh, one of the booths here. Okay. Showing off a great VDI solution using violin. ICI, the guys so, from uh, Marlboro Mass, right? Yeah, right from guy. Marlboro Mass, yeah. Um, long time big uh, EMC distributor, and uh, need some flash to go ahead and, and make those VDIs run and are demonstrating violin in the booth. So, really excited to come down and support them. Yeah, good, I mean, flash obviously is hot. Joe Tucci's been talking about it, he talked about it in his keynote. We saw the acquisition of Extreme IO. That had to make you happy. I mean, a big what, a, what a great valuation, was it? 420 million for yeah. uh, 25 people, it's rumored? <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, we have almost 400 people, so when you start doing that math, we're. We're getting pretty excited. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> you start to get the linear equation out, and it's good. It's good, but uh, yeah. So I mean, a lot, lot going on in your part of the world. Well, you saw the Facebook IPO, obviously. We did really. really uh, what do really you think excited. about that? I, I, uh, I think it's a hundred billion dollar IPO in the Valley, six year, eight year old company. Uh, it just shows that the innovation is still possible. I mean, people coming out of two thousand two were like, "Is the internet dead? Is it all been done?" And then uh, Facebook comes along and creates a whole new ecosystem. So, very, very exciting. Uh, area and uh, you know it's an area violin's not directly in that particular company but uh, it's an area where I personally invested in the, the whole area of social commerce which I think is going to be a huge explosion you know coming on that ecosystem that uh, Facebook has Google Microsoft have around uh, social connection so exciting time really to be in, in tech innovation again yeah I mean it's it's really the third mega IPO right obviously Netscape and Google and now Facebook and uh, although Facebook's taking a little heat its first full day of trading it pulled back. I guess uh, Morgan cut its estimates, you know, while the road show was going on. So a little controversy there, but you know, we would expect that data is the really the central point, the central leverage point of of Facebook, even more so than potentially advertising. It's all about data, and uh, and you know, we think there's a lot of potential there. We have we 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 agree with you. A really exciting time in tech. But so let's talk about uh, violin. Um, you guys have, you know, it's reported to be an 800 million dollar valuation based on the math that we just did with the back of the napkin on Stream IO. It's a little undervalued right now, but, uh, but uh, still pretty good. Well, I think uh, you know, that's an equity investment value. It's not an acquisition or IPO value. Um, so 
you know, I think that uh, I think the equity investment value of Extreme IO is quite a bit lower uh, when you're bought. But you know, I think EMC has been uh, one of the big buyers in the industry. Uh, they've paid uh, some some good dollars for uh, Isilon, for Data Domain. Uh, now they've paid a very high price for uh, Extreme IO, at least for all of the people in the company. Uh, so I think it's exciting. But I think what it, it's indicative of is that the value to the enterprises. Because in the end of the day, violin exists to make applications run faster and cheaper for the end user customers. And that's just, that's what we do. That's what we think about all day long. And it shows that this new approach of memory-based technologies is what the end customers want. And that the legacy approach is, you know, in, in danger of being replaced. Uh, and so the companies have to either build it themselves, it's very hard to do. The violin IP goes back to 2005. Uh, another stream we got from 2006. We're talking about six, seven years of development to bring it to fruition, uh, or they have to buy their way into the market. And uh, so I think you're seeing now, you know, this is just on the heels of a number of acquisitions, supply and acquisition, the Sandforce acquisition, Extreme IO acquisition. People trying to buy their way into the market so they can start to make products. And I read the, the, the newspaper report from yesterday in like next year. So sometime next year they hope to turn that technology acquisition into a product acquisition. Yeah, they're all flash away. I mean, it's, uh, it's curious, I mean, we're, we're watching, thinking, okay, is there going to be, you know, in the NFL, when somebody drafts a left tackle, all of a sudden there's a run on left tackles. We're, you know, we're, do you think it'll be a similar sort of run on, on flash companies, or is it a little bit too early for that? You know, I, I like in this space, so, first of all, space is so exciting. I mean, I haven't been this excited since the networking space in the 90s. Um, and I liken a lot to that industry. In that industry, you had many, many, many companies formed throughout the 90s. There was a big incumbent called IBM. And IBM a technology is called SNA. And almost every company used SNA. Uh, 70, 80% of the data flew through, through SNA in the, in the corporate network. Even the middle of the decade was still there, but out of that decade, 20, 30, 40 companies were, were bought for hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. And in the end, Cisco emerged. And IBM actually sold SNA to Cisco and sort of exited the, the networking business. They just got back into it another 10 years later. Yeah, uh, so I think that it's very interesting here, we're seeing a similar thing. There is another 30 to 50 companies already formed, venture back, that are trying to do what Violin's doing. Okay, and create all memory arrays, all flash-based memory arrays to go ahead and bring it to the market. Much like there are 30, 50, 100 companies creating IP networking devices uh, in, the, in that. So I think that it's, it's healthy, it's very healthy. And it shows that in the end, the customers or want the technology. And they're looking for the approaches to get the technology, whether it's from an incumbent vendor or an upstart, that's to be determined. Uh, what we can do is, is kind of try to copy what the great John Chambers has done, which is basically build violin, make it bigger and bigger and bigger, and keep servicing the customer over the next five, six, seven years, so that we hopefully emerge as a very important player you know, out, of that, out of that period. Well, I, I wonder if I could run this by, I kind of look at uh, violin as the data domain of Flash, in, in other words, Data Domain's value proposition was, you know, obviously it, was, it had its data deduplication piece, but a, a real appeal of Data Domain was that you could drop it in and you didn't have to change anything. You didn't have to change your processes. You guys talk a lot about no changes to applications. So I use that analogy because it's disruptive, but it's not, it's, it's disruptive to the industry, but it's not disruptive to the IT practitioner. Is that a fair oh, it, angle? It's a, it's a brilliant insight, and it's something we work really hard about. You know, we. We talked about ADCIOs when we first uh, took over Violin as Violin 2.0, we took it over, recapped it, um, and they said, listen, don't make me change my infrastructure. Someone has always given me something faster and better. Just let it plug in. It's why we have VPlex certification, SVC certification, work with Oracle ASM, Semantic Veritas. You can plug Violin today, get the benefit, don't have to change your database, and make it all happen. And that's, I think, the reason we've been able to get some of the biggest customers in the world to have already adopted Violin in such a short time period. Now, um, you guys are readying to do an IPO, right? Talk about that a little bit, why IPO? I think the public market has shown, and, and you know, hats off to the fusion management team today, in that they're basically able to derive a multi-billion dollar valuation in the public market, and able to access capital. And I think that, that we're being asked to do the same thing. Our customers, our partners are saying, go public, raise another few hundred million dollars of capital, grow violent even faster to go ahead and take advantage of the opportunity. Cisco did it in its day, Google did it in its day, Netscape did it in its day. Seems like the right thing to do for our customers, our employees, and our shareholders. Well, and you're going after some, some big markets, right? I mean, I, I presume like most CEOs slash investors, you're looking for a big market, and you've obviously targeted one. I mean, you've publicly talked about Oracle, EMC, as really ripe for change. Now, of course, you're, 
again, there's this coopetition, right? You're in with ICI, they're strong EMC partners, so there's this sort of ebb and flow of friend and foe. Um, but talk about that a little bit in terms of the size of the market that you're going after. Today, we believe we address $20 billion of annual spend. The high I.O. market and a performance optimized uh, tier two market. That's today, and all that should be in memory. And, and it's not because we say it, it's because Larry Ellison says it, Oracle should be in memory. Joe Tucci himself is tall about the future of his industry. But even more importantly, the application software vendors, okay, the SAPs of the world, who's now our investor and partner, the, the Oracles of the world, the Microsofts, the SASs of the world, they're saying all my applications should run in memory, and I want persistent memory, I want network shareable memory, and that's the way you should run your business. And so the customers are saying, yeah, I should run my business. Why should I only take 10% of my data for 90 days of a year when I can have 100% of my data in real time for all 20 years I've been in business? You're going to have a much better business if you analyze that kind of data. And so the customers are pulling it, uh, and what we're doing is we're working to deliver technology. And all the big conglomerates have amazing software. I mean, VMware, Greenplum. I mean, EMC software assets are amazing. Oracle software assets are the best in the world. Of course, that's what we do. We make the software run faster. Where we see competition is usually with a sub-segment of any company. You know, we're technically in competition sub-segment of every company, of IBM, of HP. But in reality, we're not because we're really focusing on a different problem, which is actually to give the end customers the ability to analyze and transact on huge amounts of data in real time simultaneously. And that's what we do that no one's ever done before. We, uh, we had Nino on last week from uh, SAP Ventures. Oh, yeah. that, uh, we were down at Sapphire, and he, he talked about the investment in, in violin. Um, you mentioned SAP, and remember, of course we got a big dose of HANA. That's, you know, <laughs> you, that's, if you're an SAP customer, you're going to hear a lot about that. Um, when when a, a company like SAP, which is corporate venture, invests in a company like yours, is there much discussion about, okay, how do we you know, dovetail into things like HANA, or is it more they just see a trend and, and want to get a piece of the action? It goes the other way. Usually the corporate investment comes after there's a reason to be in the market together. And so if really for all of the uh, investment partners that we have that are corporate, it's because they saw a match in the technologies of the go-to-market, and they really want to support the match. So, you know, as a small company, uh, you need to grow the company to be able to embrace and work with the companies as big as an SAP of the world. And so the investment is really just a, a show of support for what's a, a natural fit in the marketplace, either technologically or go to market. In the case of SAP, I'd say both. Yeah. Uh, it's a wonderful thing for the customers. It's a wonderful thing for the vision of the company, which is a very early on vision. You have to give them a tremendous credit for realizing that the software layer itself should be reshaped over the next seven to 10 years to all run in memory and eliminating the software itself, the bottlenecks. And so they started that program a couple years ago we happen to, I believe, uh, accelerate that program's ability to go ahead and deal with large data sets. At the same time, we take all the legacy ERP and we can move it in memory right away. Yeah. Uh, and that's really exciting. And you know our stance on that. David Floyer has basically come out and said all active data will be in flash or memory, you know, uh, eventually and probably not that far. And, and, um, so just going on to that, so we only have, I, I, I got the break sign like three minutes ago, but go oh, ahead. Okay. Uh, you know, I just got one question, which is, uh, you, you, every, the active memory is going to be uh, in, 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 in persistent flash type storage. Where do you see the value in that chain, uh, the, the management value? Where, where are the breaks in that, where you're going to fit in uh, you know, the, the next software companies that are going to come in and take advantage of that? The, the, the new ISVs or the new software, the CAs, et cetera. So I think we work with dozens of, of application level, be they SaaS mm. or be they uh, existing providers of enterprise software that are going to take advantage of that. So very clear the application layer, the end stuff that touches the customer, be it analytic, be it a, 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 a Salesforce uh, application, be it a, a, um, um, a big data stack, whatever it is, uh, those folks are definitely going to benefit from it. They can write the code cheaper and faster and better. In the middle, I think it's an open question. Um, certainly, Violin will have a full set of management features to go ahead and manage our memory spaces into the hundreds of petabytes, into the exabyte la layer. Uh, and then uh, the big middle question is, is uh, things like the virtualization layer. How much does the virtualization layer own? Uh, you can today run VM inside a Violin box, if you want to. I understand it's a vision EMC has for the future. Um, so does the virtualization layer take over thing? Does the layer, the memory layer hold right. it? Or does right. the application, as it does in Oracle today, does the application own it? Take over, right. Don't know the answer. Uh, it's exciting to find out. Right. 
Okay. All right, Don. Well, listen, thanks very much for coming. I got a lot more stuff for you. I mean, I really would hope you can come back and we can get into sort of your decision to go deep into the, you know, your own controller design. You guys have added value there. You it seems like you got a very strong technical team. You've got an interesting combination of business and technology as your background. And uh, so hopefully we can continue this down the road. But, David, uh, look forward to it. Thanks very Appreciate much for coming time. on. All All right. Great seeing you again. All right, thank you. Right there, we'll be right back after this brief break. Okay, we're back. You're watching a special production of Silicon.tv's The Cube. This is the Flash Flash Cube, where we're actually bringing you a lot of different content that we've collected, <clears throat> excuse me, around the industry. We're extracting the signal from the noise, which is what we do on The Cube, try to bring you the best information that we can. This is Dave Vellante. I'm here live in Marlboro, Massachusetts. I'm with my colleagues, John Furrier and David Floyer out in Palo Alto. David Floyer, we just listened to Don Basile the CEO of Violin, one of the things I, I've, I've said is that Violin knows how to sell. They've got a lot of sales reps, XEMC, they've got you know, a guy like uh, Gary Veal running, running Europe. These guys are selling at very high levels of the organization. They're selling business value. What do you make of what you just heard from Don Basile? Oh, he's, uh, he's a pragmatist and he's, as you say, he's a very knowledgeable person about storage in general and, and this particular marketplace. So he's, he is a great ambassador for the flash industry. I particularly liked his, uh, his, uh, his long-term vision of how applications are going to be redesigned in this new environment, uh, how that's going to take place. Uh, he, he's talking about the uh, current vendors uh, uh, readjusting their applications. I, I, I'm, I'm not quite so uh, confident that they will be the standard bearers. I think it's going to be new cloud service providers coming in uh, and uh, uh, taking over some new space, some new white space in those areas and doing things in a different way. Uh, but, uh, but I agree that the application value is where this ends. It's, it's, in, it's allowing applications to be more useful uh, more agile, um, more reflecting of the uh, rapidly changing requirements of a business. That's where the, the flash, the, the persistent storage story is going to, uh, to pan out. Too. John, um, what's your take on Basile? You're in the Valley. Basile is, Don Basile is kind of an interesting fellow. He's, he's got a you know, P PhD, I call him Dr. Basile in computer science. He's got a business background. He obviously knows how to how to, how to grow companies. What's your, what's your take on him? What's the scuttlebutt in the valley about Don Basile? Well, Dave, as you know, I've had a chance to sit down with Don multiple times, get to know him as an individual, as an entrepreneur, and as the CEO of a pre-publicly traded company. And the thing about Basile that I'm really impressed with is he is a maverick. And I've called him that on theCUBE before because he's a hard, what I call from the you know, East Coast term, hard charging. Uh, individual. He was at Stanford, has a PhD. He is smart, okay? He understands kind of what's happening at a root level. He understands what's going on at a macro level. He's had his hands at some startups. He does a lot of investing. He is plugged in. And I think he is a the maestro of orchestration and competitive as hell. So, you know, the thing about Basile that I think is interesting as a CEO in this day and, day and age is he has that 20 mile stare that he can look out in the marketplace and see the vision as David was pointing out. I think that systems vision, looking at the application model that's moving quickly with software rewriting into new architectures using persistent memory, both in memory and using flash, he sees it. So I think it's pretty obvious he's got the, the 20 mile stare, but he also can orchestrate things within that system. And also he's competitive. So, you know, hard charging, smart, super competitive. And uh, the word in the valley is he's just a, he's a great guy to work with. You know, he's, but you know, he, he's running fast. If you can't keep up with him, uh, he's going to run right by you. So I think I like his competitiveness. I like his technical and I like his business savvy. So one of the things that we talk about a lot, of course, in SiliconANGLE, Wikibon is big data. Now, you know, before I get into that, I want to just take a moment. Wikibon.org is where all the researches go there, it's all free, it's peers uh, contributing, it's, it's sharing information and ideas. SiliconANGLE.com is the reference point of tech innovation. So go there for all the daily news and analysis. Uh, check out those two sites and, and uh, we really appreciate you watching. But one of the things we talk about a lot in SiliconANGLE is big data and Wikibon. If you go to wikibon.org slash big data, you'll see a compendium of all the research we've done, the best of big data. Now, John and David, we talk about big data a lot. We talk about open source. We talk about hyperscale. The confluence of these big trends is coming together. Um, and 
Last week, In He Cho Su, who's the vice president of, of, of products and strategy at IBM's big data and information management business, uh, joined me at the 411 event. So I want you guys to watch this video from In He Cho, uh, a, a, an up and comer at IBM, very articulate. So let's watch this video and we'll come back and riff on it. Hi, this is Dave Vellante, and we're back. We're at 590 Madison Avenue, and we have a CUBE alum, Inhee Chosa, is here. And uh, Inhi, thanks very much for spending some time with us. It's always great to see you. Oh, good seeing you, Dave. Yeah, so we saw each other last week in California, uh, the big data, big data management announcement. Uh, oh, which yeah. Which was very exciting. Uh, we've been covering that like crazy on, on SiliconANGLE and Wikibon. So take us through what you guys announced and what customers are saying about it. Oh, uh, it, we're really excited, and the feedback has been tremendous since the announcement last week, Wednesday. Um, it, it's really about speed and exploration. Big data at the speed at which businesses are operating, and so what we're doing is we're really enabling clients to consume it better and more. So one of the big things that we announced was big SQL capabilities in our Infosphere Big Insights, because we found out, you know what, clients were having a hard time adopting it. They didn't really have the skills in-house to get this stuff set up quick enough. Uh, that was one piece. Another piece of the consumability, we also announced the IBM Pure Data System for Hadoop. Uh, and that is in an appliance like Simplicity so that it's really a data load ready system for big data projects uh, within under four hours. I mean, that's what we're committing to clients. So uh, a lot around com uh, consumability, performance, speed, exploration. Yeah, so we just had Steve Mills on and we've been talking about the synergies across his lines of business. So it's interesting to see you here as a big data analytics you know, person supporting the flash announcement. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, IBM is uh, really investing in Flash at an um, incredible level. So we announced today our strategy around $1 billion of um, investments in uh, research, which includes development acquisitions as well as other um, optimizations that we'll do, both in the hardware storage as well as software uh, layers. The other aspect which is exciting is this kind of marries into some of the announcements that we made around DB2 with Blue Acceleration. So Blue Acceleration is our new dynamic in memory uh, capabilities, which allows you to take um, advantages of things like, you know, active compression. So now you can have more compressed data that can take advantage of kind of the advantages of flash or taking uh, advantages of more parallel computing cap uh, capabilities and some of the hardware trends that you're seeing in flash and, and systems design. So let's talk about a little bit about the big data space. You're obviously, you know, really immersed in that area. Yeah. Um, IBM has just done a tremendous job uh, taking its analytics business and really driving to what we've cited as a number one status in, in the industry. So um, what's going on there? You're seeing the sort of old world, DB2, and the new world, Hadoop, come together. You're seeing real time, in memory. Take us through, help us squint through all the you know, machinations in that business. What's going on? Well, you know what it is, is um, it's actually sort of a confluence of things coming together, right? Clients are saying, you know what, there are new types of mobile applications. Some clients want to access things via the cloud. There's higher degrees of uh, power shifting to consumers. And all of that is tri driving kind of fundamental changes in how we do entire systems, architecture design, and software design. Now, if you think about it from a data standpoint, um, really what clients want to do is just really get better insights faster. And the investments that we're making are enabling clients to do that. And some of the new technologies and the ability of bringing all data together with the new technologies is much more affordable than it's ever been. And uh, it's just kind of an exciting time to get clients all started and, and some of the use cases that we're discovering. So one of the big themes that you hear is, is bringing real time to Hadoop. Um, and uh, it's, it, there's an interesting debate going on. I was talking to Stefan last week at the yeah, IBM yeah. announcement, Stefan from Datamir. Who's, who's, he's an early day practitioner of. Oh yeah, you know, one helped, of the uh, predecessors helped, for, uh, uh, yeah. For, for he helped build the, the build yeah, out the Hadoop. So, mm -hmm. and, he, and he's essentially saying, you know what, Hadoop is, is really designed to be batch and, and you know, the, the rest of the world, you know, will we'll connect to it. Um, but a lot of people disagree with that. A lot of people are really trying to make Hadoop look more real time. What's your take on all this? You know, uh, <laughs> Well, I have a very strong point of view on this because no, I think... That's why I'm asking you. I'm putting you right on the spot because I, I want to yeah. hear your, your angles. Well, Great. you know what? Real time is, is all relevant. 
right, relevant to the type of workloads and types of transactions right. um, that you want to run and types of analytics you want to run. So um, IBM's really the only vendor that has what we call streaming technology, the ability to consume um, all sources and all types of data in true real time. So, and when you think about Hadoop, um, the capabilities of Hadoop is really offline batch, right? Um, and, be, and the design point is to leverage sort of the distributed in memory and file system capabilities of that kind of architecture. With stream computing, it's a completely different design of being able to sense and respond. I mean, when I think about Hadoop, think about kind of the things that you do in your head, right? You're in a mode of deep reflection. You want to sit back, think about, think about what happened during the day, think about what happened during the years. Versus in your sense and respond mode, if something happens, the last thing you're doing is actually thinking deeply at that moment. You're naturally responding to based on instinct, prior experience, it all under less than a second. So those are kind of very different um, requirements in terms of the architectural design. So uh, I, I think pushing that in terms of the Hadoop system is going to be a real stretch. And streams, let's dig into that a little bit. So that'll allow you to process data in real time before you even persist it, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. It, it's, it's an ability to actually uh, stream the data, ingest the data as it's coming out, understand kind of the anomalies of what's happening, and then take action very quickly. And what's exciting about it is we're also enabling things like being able to take um, the modeling work you do in SPSS, those operators could actually reside in stream. So even as the data flows in, you can optimize even the models in which you're predicting and analyzing some of the behaviors and patterns, and then optimize that into, and, and automate that into your workflow and process. Yeah, you guys have a lot of the pieces. I mean, you've got the Cognos piece, you mentioned SPSS, yeah. you've got the Informix piece, which gives you time series. Uh, you've got your own Hadoop distribution now, and big insights, streams, I mean. Hi, this is Dave Vellante, and we're back. We're at 590 Madison Avenue, and we have a CUBE alum, Inhi Chosa, is here. And uh, Inhi, thanks very much for spending some time with us. Always great to see you. Oh, good seeing you, Dave. Yeah, so we saw each other last week in California, uh, the big data, big data management announcement. Uh, oh, which yeah. Which was very exciting. Uh, we've been covering that like crazy on, on SiliconANGLE and Wikibon. So take us through what you guys announced and what customers are saying about it. Oh. Uh, it we're really excited, and the feedback has been tremendous since the announcement last week, Wednesday. Um, it, it's really about speed and exploration. Big data at the speed at which businesses are operating, and so what we're doing is we're really enabling clients to consume it better and more. So one of the big things that we announced was big SQL capabilities in our Infosphere Big Insights because we found out, you know what, clients were having a hard time adopting it. They didn't really have the skills in-house to get this stuff set up quick enough. Uh, that was one piece. Another piece of the consumability, we also announced the IBM Pure Data System for Hadoop. Uh, and that is in an appliance like Simplicity, so that it's really a data load ready system for big data projects uh, within under four hours. I mean, that's what we're committing to clients. So uh, a lot around com uh, consumability, performance, speed, exploration. Yeah, so we just had Steve Mills on and we've been talking about the synergies across his lines of business. So it's interesting to see you here as a big data analytics you know, person supporting the flash announcement. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, IBM is uh, really investing in Flash at an um, incredible level. So we announced today our strategy around $1 billion of um, investments in uh, research, which includes development acquisitions as well as other um, optimizations that we'll do, both in the hardware storage as well as software uh, layers. The other aspect which is exciting is this kind of marries into some of the announcements that we made around DB2 with Blue Acceleration. So Blue Acceleration is our new dynamic in memory uh, capabilities, which allows you to take um, advantages of things like, you know, active compression. So now you can have more compressed data that can take advantage of kind of the advantages of flash or taking ca uh, advantages of more parallel computing cap uh, capabilities and some of the hardware trends that you're seeing in flash and, and systems design. So let's talk about a little bit about the big data space. You're obviously, you know, really immersed in that area. Yeah. Um, IBM has just done a tremendous job uh, taking its analytics business and really driving to what we've cited. Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. I'm here with David Floyer, who's on the West Coast right now. David, before we queue up Vincent Su, who's the CTO of IBM Storage Division, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, this notion of getting rid of the horrible storage stack. So, um, what do we mean by that? What, let's talk about atomic rights. Let me start there. 
David, what are atomic rights? What does that mean? So an at uh, uh, atomic right is a right that you can do once and once only. Um, and the normal way that rights are written using the SCSI stack is that you have a sort of two-phase or even three or four-phase commit uh, where you go backwards and forwards. Remember that journey to, uh, um, to from San Francisco to Los Angeles? You, you queue in every now and again and say, okay, how are you doing? Have you got it? Uh, and you acknowledge it back and then say something else. So you, you have to make sure you know where that, where that stuff is and then be able to make sure that it's safe the other, at, the, uh, at its destination. Uh, atomic rights are a single right directly to uh, the storage media, in this case, flash. And uh, the way that it's done is uh, to uh, write it to the controller uh, of the flash, and there usually there's some sort of um, capability for uh, pers persistent capacitance, for example, onto DRAM or using MRAM. Uh, at that moment, the data is secure. So we can ensure that the data is absolutely captured. And that can be done in around 100 nanoseconds. So an atomic write really changes the name of the game. Instead of you talking about milliseconds or even microseconds through the, to, to the traditional SSD, you're, you're able to get it down into these nanosecond areas, 100 nanosecond uh, area. So the, the benefit of that from a database point of view is I've committed my write. I know I've got it safe. Now I can uh, process the next transaction. And I improve my transaction rate, my ability to do database calls immensely as a result of that. Okay, so who was doing atomic rights? I mean, obviously Fusion IO was really the first to get to market with that, correct? Yes, Fusion IO is the only one that has put together all of the software to do this. And the software includes a virtualized uh, VSL layer that they describe it. It is the uh, file system, uh, in their case, DirectFS. And it's the APIs that can be used to, uh, to, to run this. So they've put together the whole stack. And, and, and in fact, they've also committed, it's all part of Linux. Uh, it, the only people from a database using it at the moment are MySQL. So it's a, a limited, but actually in the area that they're going after, the hyperscale environment, that is the environment that, uh, that's, that's the software environment, Linux and MySQL environment that people like Facebook are working in. So it's, uh, if from an enterprise point of view, it's a long way off doing it on DB2 or Oracle, but it's a very important first step of creating this total stack. And clearly, uh, IBM and EMC have to also create similar stacks uh, to be in the marketplace, uh, HP as well. Uh, they have to create the, these sort of stacks. There is a there is a, a industry standard NVMe uh, that's being talked about, but that yet hasn't yet got down to the level of atomic rights. Yeah. That's, so why do they why do these other companies have to have to develop their own? Why don't they just uh, write to NVMe? Well, it's, it's not yet at a level of being able to write these. It isn't defined in that stack yet as an atomic right. That, that's a sort of future dimension of that. Uh, they've, it's a very loose NVM, it's non-volatile memory, and they're trying to do this for the next generation of non-volatile you know, memristors or whatever comes after. So it's a long-term uh, ambition. Uh, what uh, Fusion IO is, is a much shorter, pragmatic, let's, let's get something out there and let's iterate on that. All right, so you're saying that, uh, you're saying NVMe is not ready and, and companies like IBM and EMC and maybe even VMware shouldn't wait. They're actually going to have to go Absolutely. and develop their own I mean, proprietary it, yeah, standards. In particular VMware. VMware hypervisors can take immediate advantage of this sort of technology and build it into the uh, to the I.O. stack, which is always the weakness of virtualization. So, so VMware. So hypervisors, uh, both from Microsoft and from uh, uh, and from VMware should should be investing in this very heavily. And, and I would think that IBM as well. I mean, IBM's got hypervisors, IBM's got file systems, Absolutely. IBM's got OS's, IBM's got flash, they got server expertise. Got I would think they, that within the IBM stack, IBM could really make things like DB2 uh, and, and other servers, Linux servers, et cetera, 
run really, really fast. Uh, IBM at its heart is a technology company and it's a systems technology company. It's always pr uh, provided that systems view of the world. And that's the opportunity that IBM really has is to bring together uh, under Steve Mills, all the areas in the development tools, all the areas in Linux, the open systems tools, all the areas in the, in the uh, servers themselves, bringing those servers close, creating that, uh, those caches, coherent caches uh, on uh, clusters of servers, uh, bringing together the storage with the flash, bringing together the software infrastructure to, uh, to, to enable this. This is right in their wheelhouse. And uh, it, IBM, Dell, HP, uh, IBM and HP are more uh, traditional systems vendors. Those are the people that have those capabilities. And uh, uh, it's a surprise to me, for example, that I, I hear that IBM uh, uh, may be trying to sell that, uh, that part of their server division. Well, what about Oracle? Um, you know, where do they fit in this whole thing? Is this something that they you expect Oracle to do as well? This at atomic write capability and oh, and uh, absolutely, they they should be. Um, they uh, they uh, have Flash. They have a lot of information about Flash. They know about the Flash. They certainly are a systems software supplier. They got database. <laughs> they definitely got a database or two. Um, they got the, the world's leading database. The, the interesting thing is, I mean, the complexity of those databases to overcome how to write data from here and wait till you get back from uh, Los Angeles, the complexity of those databases is immense. Uh, as things get, uh, Flash becomes more and more available and atomic rights become more available, so it's going to be interesting to see a lot of other uh, database vendors come into the marketplace. And I've never seen the interest in database that there is at the moment. It's a burgeoning here in the valley, and uh, it's, uh, it's if if that is if that is nothing else, that's a wake up call to Oracle that they really need to get on board and uh, get to understand what this cloud and these cloud service providers are looking for. Yeah, as John Furrier said, database used to be boring, and now now it's very exciting. All right, David, I know you have to run to another call. Um, that was a good setup for this, this geek out segment that we had uh, down in New York with Vincent Sue, who's the CTO of IBM Storage Division. Uh, so let's, let's, what we're going to do is we're going to watch this video and then we're going to come back and then John Furrier and I are going to pick it up, David, get back as soon as you can. Uh, then we've got uh, uh, Gary Ornstein coming in from Fusion IO and Scott Dietzen, who's the CEO of Pure. Uh, but right now, let's watch Vincent Sue of IBM. Keep it right there. Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. We're here at 590 Madison Avenue in New York City at the big IBM announcement today, Flash Ahead. I'm here with Vincent Sue, who's an IBM fellow and CTO of the storage business. Vincent, welcome back to theCUBE. Thank you. Good to see you again. So, uh, big announcement today. Um, you guys are all in on Flash. Talk about uh, Flash as a game changer. Why is it such a game changer from a technical perspective? You know, over the last, you know, 50 years, the whole system design and the software applications are written pretty much to start to accommodate the I.O. problem. As you can see that for the last you know, 10 years, the CPU has improved uh, 10 times, network improved 100 times, but storage three performance-wise only improved 1.5, 1.2 times. A lot of the system architectures and software are really trying to work around their problems. Now when the I.O. bottleneck is removed, Okay, you all of a sudden, a lot of things become possible. Okay, not just the traditional application. Now you can do more because we can do more with a much shorter time. Yeah, so um, on the one hand, we heard from customers today that they're basically dropping in a, an all flash array. Mm -hmm. It's a block based device, mm -hmm. looks like any block based device, and it immediately mm -hmm. accelerates performance. On the other hand, uh, over time, there's great potential to sort of re-architect infrastructure and applications. Mm -hmm. What do you see as, as, as that potential and how will that change infrastructure, applications, and ultimately business? Yeah, so, so for example, today, 
the let me just give you a most one of the most obvious example today in the, in the database design we everybody do database reorganization database reorg right you have to reorg database why because you want to get the best performance so you need the data sort of adjacent to each other on the on the platter okay we need to question that <laughs> those business probably not doesn't need to do it anymore or doesn't need to do as often anymore so all these parameters that we do and to tune our system those had to be rethink even in our IO path, okay, today we try to buffer up as much as possible because go to this is very slow, right? How much metadata you can put in the system to make the sense, so it allow you to make sense from the data. Those things in the past is very hard to do because every little IO go to this is very slow. But now, because the flash, uh, flash enabled system allow you to put a much better metadata rich systems available. So you can do a lot more with the, what you have. So let's talk about metadata a little bit. So metadata sure. today is sort of locked in the, the device, whether it's a network device, a server, an array, uh, and it's sort of controlled by, by that device. Do you see that changing? Will this whole notion of software-led or software-defined you know, infrastructure allow metadata to actually be a shared resource? Uh, first of all, first question, and second question is, where is that going to get managed? Okay, so you are absolutely correct that the metadata is where, uh, first of all, I mean, metadata will allow you to make sense from the data, from the raw data you have. So that is, I think that we are getting to the we are getting to the point that this world going to have a very, very metadata rich information. Okay, but in the past, because the metadata is you know compared to the raw data, metadata is much smaller. You know, you go to those the smaller I/O, it, it costs you a lot. So a lot of people that buffer up the metadata in the in the DRAM memory, so it's sort of limited amount of data metadata you can have. But these days, with the now that with the flash systems available, you are able to do a much better rich metadata and be able to share between the different application. The thing is that these days, there are the a lot of time that we see over and over again, different application has the same content, but that we. They cannot really share the data without reshape their metadata around the raw data. So now, with this kind of technology, we enable you to be able to share those uh, share those content much easier. Once you can transform those metadata quicker. Yeah. So you heard in my in my panel that I was hosting, I was doing some back of the napkin calculations last night, and I had I had uh, you know CPU speeds at, at, at mm -hmm. na nanoseconds, 10 to the mm -hmm. minus nine, and and, and disk speeds uh, 10 to the minus three, six orders of magnitude, delta. I'm not sure if that's exactly right, but it's, it's Close big. Enough. Right? Close yes, enough, yeah. right? So my question then is, who's going to control that metadata? You can't really control that metadata from slow storage. Doesn't it have to be controlled from fast servers? In the past, people tried to put all the metadata in the DRAMs. Because if you control the metadata in the slow storage, then it's just too slow. Right, it's just, especially the metadata is a very small I/O. Small I/O is re extremely expensive mm -hmm. to the hard disk. But the problem is, if you want to have a large amount of metadata to make your data, to be able to make sense from your data, that you cannot put everything in DRAM, and that's where the flash, all flash system come into play here. Yeah, excellent. So, um, so how do you see this thing progressing? You guys are putting a, a billion dollars in. Obviously, you've got, you know, investments, organic and potentially inorganic. We're going to ask Steve Mills about that. But where do you see this whole flash thing playing out over time? Okay, so the flash optimization is across all the la layers, from the fundamental core technology, that's what uh, the Texas memory system has done a s superb job in the, you know, to make the flash more uh, durable and you know, high performance. Then you ha we have an overall system design, the power system, sys uh, Z system, the storage systems. How do I design the system? So rest of the system is not going to be the bottleneck, right? Then we have a middleware design to take advantage of that. Remember I talked about the database reorgs, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of, you know, the sort of software-defined storage interface to allow the, allow the middleware uh, application to be able to truly take advantage of those technology. Because at the end of the day, people don't want to spend their time to fine-tune where the data placement is going to be. They want to be able to talk to this, 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 this devices. At the end of the day, what IBM Vision is going to be take this storage problem from application. All you see is an infinite flat space. You can just rewrite to it and everything will be persistent. Back to the days of single level store <laughs> and it's, uh, it's super fast. All right, Vincent Sue, thanks very much for coming back on theCUBE and uh, great to hear your perspective. So keep it right there everybody. We'll be right back with our next guest.